Reflection with theologian Father James Basic, lecturer and campus minister at the University of Toledo. I think we'll never pray authentically and well unless we try to get it straight from the beginning. We are totally always dependent upon this God. Today on Reflection, Father Basic talks with Sidney Condre, a doctoral candidate at the University of Toledo. The topic of this week's Reflections is the Lord's Prayer, learning to pray better. And now, here is Father Basic. Sydney, let's talk a little bit about the question of prayer. Um, I think a prayer should be of importance. There's an interesting phrase in the scriptures. Uh, the disciples say to Jesus, uh, teach us to pray. And in Luke's gospel, there, you know, there's two versions of the Lord's Prayer. In Luke's gospel, uh, Jesus is praying, uh, and the disciples witness this, and it prompts their question, uh, Lord, teach us to pray. There must have been something inspiring about the way Jesus prayed and uh, that, uh, that prompted that. I mean, they must have, he must have been transformed or changed or deep in prayer, or they saw that it was the spring uh, source for his own life or something. But uh, And that phrase, Lord, teach us to pray, is, is one that maybe we could all sort of experience in one way or another. I mean, I do know a certain number of people who are serious about prayer. I know you're one of those and that uh, try to learn to pray better. But I feel that, that most everybody can sort of get into that. Uh, a lot of people are feeling, well, I ought to start to learn how to pray, or I ought to pray better, or there's something missing in my life, and I don't know what it is, and maybe it, it really has to do with prayer. I want to just spend a minute on that, you know, that thirst for prayer, or the desire for prayer that we see in our own lives. I think, of course, uh, prayer represents our attempt to come into some kind of relationship with God. And Jesus does give us a beautiful example of how to begin to approach prayer in his own prayer that he does give us in the in the gospel. So he responded in the scriptures to this request, Lord, teach us to pray by telling us the Lord's Prayer. And I, I do think that uh, there is sort of a, of a thirst that way, uh, a desire to deepen prayer. Um, you know, that uh, I always think of myself as being a very much of a beginner along that line and praying in, in, a, in a very simple kind of way. And But there's a lot of times in my life when I sort of have a sense that there's a call to move a little forward on that or to improve a little bit. I can't say I've made a lot of progress along that line, but I do feel it now and then that that tug to say, couldn't I learn to pray a little bit better? I guess one of the things I've often suggesting to people, well, if we're still praying the way we did in grade school and we've developed in other areas of our life, there's probably something amiss here. You know, we, we ought to, if, if you improve in other areas of life, you ought to improve in that one. So maybe that's, uh, you know, at least something I know from my own experience. I, I think you do as well. I would like to say that I th from the beginning, I, we're all beginners. But uh, each of us has to feel out our own way to pray and uh, experiment and explore how it might be best to uh, find some kind of intimacy with God. So it's a matter of beginning where Jesus begins, where uh, he suggests that we do have a loving parent. Um, perhaps that's one image that we can relate to. But there might be other images in the Bible as well that we could relate to that would be appropriate for us, depending upon our needs and our personalities, too. Mm -hmm. So everyone uh, has different images of God, and that has a lot to do with how you end up praying, that's for sure. I mean, if God is an angry and wrathful God for you, then it, it becomes pretty hard to pray. I mean, one is more afraid of God. I often feel that that's some, one reason why people feel guilty going to church sometimes. They, they feel like they've done something wrong. They feel that God's going to punish them or is against them. And therefore, when they walk into church, they're uncomfortable. they got anxieties going, and they, they have fears, and they, so they don't want to be there. And so I think that's some, one reason why a lot of people don't go to church, and it's probably one reason why a lot of people don't pray, because I mean, there's no trust level set up. I think we could think about this very much on the model of a conversation. I mean, you're not going to talk to somebody if you don't uh, and reveal anything of any deeper nature about yourself unless you trust the person. And uh, there's a, a relationship of care set up. And I think that that would be very much true in thinking about God, unless we've 
come to some level that God is trustworthy or on our side, it becomes very hard to talk to that God. And I guess when I say talk to that God, that is a simple uh, statement of what prayer is, a simply attempt to communicate with God. I think you said it in a little deeper way. Uh, it's an attempt to establish more intimacy with God or, or to come closer to God. But uh, for a lot of people, it's just a simple, well, I'm going to talk to God. That's what, what prayer is. And I suppose when you say that, well, there's some people who aren't even at that stage. I mean, let's face it, they just don't pray. They have, they don't know what it means. They're not in the habit of doing it. And, and uh, they really perhaps don't miss it <laughs> because they've never known it in their lives. Uh, they would have to be helped in one way or another to give it a try, and then maybe they would feel the need or this thirst that I'm talking about to to try to do more of it. Well, I, everybody could say, I think, either should say, either are saying or should say, Lord, teach me to pray. Either, and I think one way or another, it's either saying, Lord, help me improve or help me start. Uh, fill up the emptiness in my heart, get me on balance, help me to understand life in a deeper way, all translations in my mind of, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, Jesus' answer is uh, to tell us the Our Father. And uh, I think you've already set the stage there for talking about the first phrase, just to say, Our Father, or in Luke's Gospel, Father. And that's our English translation of the Aramaic word Abba, which is, was the familiar way the children addressed their father. They called their fathers Abba, uh, which translates something like Daddy or Dad or Papa, um, and, and already sets a stage. I mean, the, the, the great um, theologian Edward Skillebeck, a um, Dominican priest, uh, talks about Jesus' Abba experience uh, the, as the thought that that's really distinctive about Jesus. Uh, that use of the word Abba for God has very little precedent in, in Hebrew thought. I mean, to start talking about God as Papa or Daddy is strange because the Hebrews had a very exalted notion of God. In fact, their notion was so exalted, they didn't want to use God's name. Uh, they, they wanted to have silence about the name. They forgot how to pronounce it, as a matter of fact, because they seldom said it. So Yahweh, we reconstruct that today. So Jesus, to start talking about God, the great transcendent Yahweh, the Holy One, as Abba, is, is really quite um, a movement forward in the history of religious thought. It suggests our great intimacy and closeness with God, and I think flows out of Jesus' experience. And that's where I thought you were right on target in saying it all it depends on our experience of God. It depends on our general perception of God, how we're going to address God in prayer. Uh, my perception is that, first of all, God wants to be close and wants to be intimate, and therefore, um, from this initiative, seeks in some way to bring us to come to him or her, as you uh, might want to um, suggest, whichever, because we need to talk about God in, in some fashion, so we... You're talking about the pronouns you yeah. use there, his and her. Yeah, I think it's very common today for uh, a lot of people who want to raise consciousness on the question to ta use the feminine pronoun about God to remind us that uh, women have authentic experiences of God as well, and that God is not only paternal, but also maternal, and that in the scriptures there's a lot of feminine imagery of God that we ought to rely on and, and build into our whole understanding and that therefore both men and women ought to filter their experience into our, lo our picture, our growing picture, which will never be complete of who God is for us. God remains the mystery, the inexhaustible one, and uh, all of our imagery simply points to that mystery. So I think this whole wrestling with the pronouns really does have bearing on the question of prayer. I mean, there's a lot of women, or a lot of men for that matter, too, who are going to find their prayer be more effective if they don't say so much our Father, but uh, address God in more maternal terms and think maternally. And those would be especially people who have harsh experiences of their father and maybe very loving and tender experiences with their own mother. Uh, their base, experientially, is going to be much more uh, constructive for them if they focus in on those positive maternal relationships and relate God to that. So you're very wrestling with the words his and her there, I think have a lot of meaning for a lot of people in prayer. They're just going to be better off 
some people if they think uh, to pray to God to, in terms of their kindly and tender and nurturing mother. Shall we uh, say anything more about that, except uh, that phrase, Abba, except that becomes the base, the trust? I suppose if we're going to pray well, Sydney, we have to walk around with an abiding sense of our dependence upon God so that we feel it in all aspects of the life, so that you feel de dependence on God when things are going well and when they're going badly, when you're celebrating joys and trying to deal with your sorrows, when you're in daily, ordinary life and the humdrum routine, as well as when the big moments of celebration with loved ones and family, that it doesn't matter. We're always dependent upon God. We must pray, as the traditional phrase says, as though everything depends upon God. We really have to get that straight. My my conviction is if you don't get that straight, you can never pray properly because then you're going to just turn to God like a foxhole piety, as we used to say at the time of the Second World War, that no atheists in foxholes, that in the time of war there's a, you know, there's a need, and so you turn to God. I think we'll never pray authentically and well unless we try to get it straight from the beginning. We are totally always dependent upon this God who, who, who really is trustworthy. You know, is is on, fundamentally on our side. Now that is the message of uh, the Abba image. Is God is trustworthy and is on our side, and is with us, and is for us. And therefore, we can turn to this God in all of our life experiences, with all of our different difficulties and needs, but also with our joys and and uh, good things, and celebrate with God what. Uh, is going on in our life right now. I wonder if that's what the scriptures mean when it suggests that we should pray always. You know, I mean, you can't be saying the Lord's Prayer every minute of the day, although the Eastern monks tried to do that. Do you remember that? The Eastern monks tried to say Jesus with every breath. You know, there was the Jesus Prayer, and some of them tried to get to the point that with absolutely every breath they took, there would be sort of the note word Jesus in, in their mind and heart. Uh, they took sort of literally this scriptural notion that we should pray always. But I think for most people, it translates something like this. Have an abiding sense of your dependence upon a trustworthy God. Walk through your everyday activities like with that attitude and that perspective. That becomes, I think, this pray always admonition. Cindy, let's go on to the rest of this Lord's Prayer here. Our Father who art in heaven, it says, hallowed be your name. Um, so this becomes a, what we might call a prayer of praise, uh, giving glory to God. Why don't we talk about that a little bit? Now this brings in the transcendence of God for me, the uh, hallowedness of God's name, his being, his person, her uh, identity. So that we're, uh, the, this might connect in with Isaiah's, Isaiah's prayer, holy, holy, holy. Remember that? He's in the temple, and there's this tremendous presence of God, and it's sort of overwhelming, and, and by heavens, you're going to be blown away by this God. It, it's sort of scary to be in the presence of this God, holy, holy, holy. It, it is the sense that part of the human task, and in fact, the whole of creation is to praise God. It, it's, it's the product of God. We are the product of the whole evolutionary process, which God has set in order and has uh, sustained and fueled throughout all of these centuries. And now it's our turn to give a voice to that. Um, that, that that's an intriguing notion, isn't it? That the whole of creation is supposed to give praise to God. The psalmist saw, saw that. The psalms thought that creation itself praises God by its beauty, by its splendor, because it reflects God's glory. But now we humans are the voice of creation, and it's now up to us to make an explicit word back to God, uh, glory, glory, holy, holy, we praise you, Lord, for your goodness. I mean, I think that's a sort of way to pray, isn't it, to begin to image God as the creator, the vast one, the one who's responsible for all of this thing. Uh, what was it that Thomas Berry, the uh, person who writes about ecological matters, says, try putting your hand in front of your face, look at it, and say, this has taken God 20 billion years to produce. You know, so we could say the same way, look at, let's look at myself, my ability to think and to talk and reflect. It's taken God 20 billion years to produce this kind of creature. Now I better use it and say glory to the, to the creator who is responsible for all of that. 
of the response of all, whether it's to the glory of a sunset or to the first smile of your newborn infant, is, I think, an authentic and uh, immediate prayer that we can offer and do offer to God. Is that, did you use, use the word awe there? Is awe, that what you said? yes, awe. Yeah. That's a good word in relationship to prayer, I think. I once knew an atheist who was overawed by the birth of his uh, firstborn son. He was overawed. He was just taken away, and, and he didn't really understand it. You know, uh, he didn't know what to do with that experience. He didn't know who he was sending this awe towards, I suppose, or, or whatever words of gratitude were welling up in his heart. He didn't know how to express them. And I think for the believing person, for the theist, and for the Christian, members of the religious traditions, our Jewish friends, Muslim friends who are into the prayer life, we, we understand there's a place to send those deepest sentiments. I think that uh, that's, that's helpful because belief gives us a sense of what are the real wellsprings of the joy and the, the positive feelings and, as you say, the awe that we experience about life. And, um, and part of that is to send it back to God in a way. Praise God for this goodness, this truth we find, this beauty that we discover in our world. And yet it's not God who needs our praise, it's we who need to praise God. <laughs> Important perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, we, we probably should maybe make more of that in general. I mean, scriptures say the Spirit prays in us. Um, and, and the suggestion is that prayer does us good. And that it's always somehow God's initiative and our response to that call of God. Well, Sydney, um, so we got praise here. We've, we've got the Abba experience, the trusting of God, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be your name, we say. So that ought to be... And I think maybe a lot of people don't spend enough time praising God. I mean, it's pretty easy to ask God, I need help to pass an exam or to make this relationship work or to deal with my financial troubles or whatever or to for world peace, but maybe we often uh, forget the pure praise of God. Probably ought to try to put more time and energy into that. It's beginning to look at and think about the good things in our life. Becomes the basis of that. Yes, definitely. I think that's true. Now the prayer goes on. It says, Your kingdom come. Uh, that becomes a dominant image in the scriptures. Uh, to say your kingdom come, we often translate in the New American Bible these days as the reign of God, R-E-I-G-N, the reign of God. That means where God's peace is present and justice is there, where there's mutuality, where people approach each other as equals, uh, where there's a re fundamental respect where their justice is cared for and the poor and needy are watched after and so on. So that kingdom come is a prayer that says something like, God, we want the best for our world. We, want, we, we recognize you're the source of the beauty and goodness, the shalom, as our Jewish friends say. That is maybe one of the best words for capturing what the kingdom's all about, the reign of God. And we want that to happen. That's a nice broad-based prayer. And, of course, it's right in line with Jesus because that was Jesus' own favorite metaphor for the cause that he had undertaken. The cause was God's cause. It was a human cause. It was to build up the human situation. And his favorite phrase for that was this kingdom notion. So it fits right into the center of the preaching of Jesus. So he's teaching us how to pray, Thy kingdom come. Make this real in the world. And help us to make it real in the world, because we are instruments of that creation, that reality. Therefore, we need to be aware that we do have a contribution we can make, and to look toward making that contribution, whatever it is. Uh, that's a perfect kind of response in my mind to that. In other words, thy kingdom come is not just put it in God's hands, but I must respond to that, do my little bit to try to make sure there's a little bit more peace in the world. That'd be a great thing to get up in the morning and say the Our Father, thy kingdom come, and then say, well, I'm going to walk through my day today and uh, try not to do too much damage, but I'm going to do something positive like make somebody smile or make life a little bit better or make things at work go a little more smoothly or 
bring more harmony to my family or, or do something to help someone in need. That, that would be a great response to the Lord's Prayer. And as you point out, prayer isn't just a, a per, you know saying words. It's supposed to deal with how we are, our character, our personality, our, the way we are as people. Our very being should be affected by our prayer. And that would mean then it would spread. If we, if we meant it, we'd be able to, to do for others as well. And then it says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, suggesting that prayer has got to do with being in tune with the will of God. I immediately think of Jesus putting this into action in the agony in the garden where Jesus says, I don't want to do this. Father, let this chalice pass from me, sensing his own impending danger and possible death. He says, don't make me go through this. Um, but then he goes on, not my will, but thine be done. It means that we're sort of, prayer ought to put us in tune with the God who's calling us by name. Well, it seems to me, too, that uh, part of that prayer of thy will be done is based in that basic trust that God is with us and for us. Therefore, uh, whatever the particular situation, even though I find it painful myself, I can still somehow with God walk through the particular experience and in doing so find that I've grown or somehow it has been uh, a positive that I totally didn't expect in and, the beginning. And, and that's true even if it is a, a negative kind of experience, Correct. like a challenge you didn't want to face but you went ahead and faced it or a um, cross that you carried even though it seemed too heavy and so on. I think that's a good point that if we are in tune with God's will, which means trying to figure out what it is we're supposed to do in life and trying to respond to some call higher than ourselves, that very often there are positive results of that. And we see them uh, by the fidelity to this call, often it works out. But it's not a Pollyanna kind of thing, and often it's uh, in the midst of it you do not see it or, or feel it, and that I would like to um, make very clear. Yeah, so, so you, I noticed a number of times here you said you didn't want the prayer to just be sort of a pie-in-the-sky kind of thing. I take it you're referring to the, the thing, use of prayer as an escape from reality or the notion of magical notion that we're going to make God do what we want or we say so many Our Fathers and God will give us the favor we want. You, you're, you're guarding against that, right, by that kind of comment? That's correct. When uh, often as children we either have this image of God as this stern judge whom we have to be or are afraid of, or the lollipop grandfather who's going to give us whatever we want when we want it, and neither of those is, is correct. We need to grow beyond both of those kinds of bases for relating to God. So, so we want to make sure this thy will be done has part of the cross in it. And for Jesus, it, in the agony in the garden that we talked about, it certainly is that. Father, let this chalice pass from me, not my will but thine be done, really then leads him to his death. And uh, a bitter sort of death at that, deserted by friends and misunderstood by religious and political authorities and so on, and a very painful death. So that uh, the cross is clearly part of that phrase. So I guess part of what I would get out of what you're saying is we ought not say it lightly, thy will be done, because it may well involve uh, a certain amount of suffering in life and difficulty, but always with the con clear conviction that that's the right way to go and will lead eventually to greater life, more maturity, and so on. Well, essentially, I think it needs to be clear, too, that suffering and difficulty are going to be part of life whether we pray, pray our, thy will be done or not. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> Build into the human condition. Yeah, build in. And so what prayer is going to do then is help to give us a particular perspective on the inevitable cross in life that everyone's going to have to face. And we hope a positive sort of perspective. Sydney, the next uh, petition here says, give us to, uh, our daily bread. Uh, a clear petition, petitionary prayer. And in addition to prayers of praise of God and thanksgiving for gifts and, and trying to be in tune with God's will, petition is certainly part of biblical prayer. And Jesus didn't hesitate to, uh, to teach us that. Give us our day, our daily bread might well say, Lord, give me uh, health. May give me strength to carry on and enable me to do my best in this particular trial or difficulty. Bless my family. Try to take care of uh, those who are suffering. Pray for the starving who don't have bread. 
uh, all of that is part of petitionary prayer is very legitimate. I think it's important to see it in some perspective. I mean, again, it's not magic that if we all say enough prayers that someone's going to suddenly get out of the hospital who has a terrible disease. It doesn't happen automatically like that. We need to bring a measure of faith and acceptance to our petitions as well. Oh, I would have always been struck with the daily aspect of this spread, not uh, next week or next year, but be concerned about today, what uh, I need today, what are my responsibilities and tasks of today to give me the strength, uh, the insight, the courage, uh, whatever is needed to be able to carry out these particular tasks and to leave tomorrow for tomorrow. I think that uh, relates to some other scriptural passages that mm -hmm. Jesus. Yeah, uh, that, that seems.